Uh, welcome everyone uh, once again to Janavarthini FDB based weekly knowledge session. As we all know, in DPDPA consent lays the foundation of how organizations collect, process, and manage personal data. And uh, this is a very interesting domain where we have uh, had multiple deliberations. We today have Mr. Apu Gard, CEO and co founder of Orva, speaking about consent management solutions under DPDPA. Uh, Mr. Apoor was a young entrepreneur who has a strong data science background. He was with uh, Meta before he started Orva. Orva is providing data access governance and management solutions. Uh, very happy to have you with us, uh, Apoor. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Manju. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, we would definitely be going through uh, content management. Uh, would also spend like uh, a couple of minutes uh, just uh giving a brief overview of dpdpa uh but before i start uh just a, a quick intro about myself so i was leading data science team at meta for la uh, last four years before starting orva uh and have worked in the privacy domain for around a year at meta itself uh before uh, orva so have a pretty uh much good background and like was looking forward to dpdpa that was one of the reasons that we actually started up in the space. Uh, happy to jump in. Uh, probably, uh, so the agenda is to just go through a couple of things on DPDPA side, then jump into content management, uh, discuss that uh, for around five, 10 minutes, and then uh, we'll open the forum for uh, Q&A so that people can uh, ask the questions that they have. Uh, a background why we are having this chat is because like we have spent a lot of time understanding the DPDPA, uh, the consent management under DPDPA, which is a little different from uh, the existing privacy laws across the world. Uh, we have worked with lawyers, government agencies uh, to actually understand uh, these laws as we have built our product. Uh, so yeah, happy to uh, move on. So under DPDPA, uh, just to give a brief overview, there are three key uh, terms. Uh, one is data fiduciary, which is mostly organizations or companies processing or using the data uh, of the user. Another is data principal, which is the individuals like uh, you know, Manju or anyone whose data is being used or whose personal data it, uh, it relates to. And the third is personal data. So it is any information relating to an identifiable individual. So there are two parts. One is personal data, and then there is sensitive data, which can be Aadhaar card, PAN card, or any such thing, which can actually harm the individual much more than normal data. So quick, very quick summary of the DPDPA. And uh, again, like all of this relates to the consent at the end of the day. So one is the data processing. So personal data should be processed in accordance with the act and with the data principles consent. So mm -hmm. at the first place, when, uh, when a new user joins in, the company should take the uh, data principles consent or the user consent that whatever data they are going to collect. And then they must also give them the notice about, okay, like these are the different data sets being collected. What is the purpose that the data will be used what are the rights of the user? So the user can withdraw the consent at any time, for example. And they should also tell how to lodge complaints in case if their requirements are not being met. So it's not that this should be done only for the new users that are joining in. This should also be done for the users whose data has been collected in the past and who are already the user of a particular product of the company. So for example, uh, let's say if Flipkart has 1 million or 10 million users, they have still to inform all those 10 million users about what their data is being collected, how it is being used internally, and the different rights they have uh, regarding the <clears throat> privacy. Third thing is uh, data requirement. So data principles can inquire why their personal data is needed and the fiduciary must provide accurate answers. So, uh, and then there's fourth thing called data protection officer. So during the consent, uh, the, um, the companies should share the details of a data protection officer or an authorized representative 
uh, with the data principles through the point of the notice that we talked about and then the data deletion. So uh, data deletion is something that wouldn't happen immediately. So it's not like if uh, consent is pulled off, the data has to be deleted immediately by the companies. The data deletion has to be done, making sure that all other laws are kept into mind. So for example, banking sector uh, data has to be stored for more than two years. And um, that's the law uh, basically for the banking sector. So that still needs to be uh, kind of withhold and the those kind of laws supersedes the DPDPA in the long run. Cool. Uh, moving to consent management. So, I mean, what do we understand by consent? Uh, consent uh, just means that uh, the end user has to say yes to something or they can at any point say no to something, right? Uh, so the first thing is withdrawal of consent. So I think consent management is a concept that is there across all the different privacy laws uh, that uh, we can think of like GDPR, CCPA, uh, et cetera. And similarly, we also have that under DPDPA, but there are certain minor differences between these different laws. But first of all, let's go through what is uh, withdrawal of consent. So data principles can uh, withdraw consent anytime uh, which can affect the services that they might receive. But then uh, again, like companies should cease to exist or process uh, any data that they are collecting of the user. So what that, does that mean? Uh, that means that if a user says, don't collect my data anymore or don't process my data anymore, company should stop using their data for any purpose that they might be using. And an individual under DPDPA has the right to withdraw their consent at any time. And this should be literally as easy as uh, giving the consent. So it should not be like that, hey, uh, I have uh, given you consent, but then withdrawing a consent is like under five different tabs and it is impossible for the user to have that. Second is, uh, again, uh, as I mentioned, obligation to cease data processing. So. As soon as consent is withdrawn, uh, the data fiduciary must stop processing the data. And they should not just stop themselves, but they should also stop or ask the other third parties that they are, have been sharing the data with to stop the data processing. A very simple example is uh, that a lot of companies use different analytics tools, for example, like Amplitude, right? And those different third party companies, which are analytics companies, maybe like Google Analytics, they also store the data for the user. But let's say if I withdraw the consent from the parent company, uh, the parent company should request uh, Google Analytics to delete the user data or like uh, to stop processing the user data as well. Then uh, again, uh, the uh, fourth point being uh, data processing uh, post consent withdrawal. So as I mentioned that the fiduciary must stop processing the data. However, the data deletion should not happen immediately. It should happen in accordance with the sector specific laws and they can take their own time to delete the data even after the consent uh, management is withdrawn. So I think coming to the final thing, which is the most important thing and the biggest difference between the different laws uh, like GDPR versus DPDPA. So in under GDPR, uh, the consent manager is the responsibility of the data fiduciary, which is the company. So company can appoint anyone, uh, like any company, and they will manage the consent management for the company and for the user. But this third party is the responsible to the company, not to the principal. Whereas under DPDPA, consent manager has the responsibility towards the data principal and not the data fiduciary. So what that means is that, let's say if I am a consent manager and this consent manager can be anyone by the way, according to the current definition. So it can be any person uh, that I can appoint. I can appoint my father, for example, as a consent manager and he can request the data to be deleted from the company. 
So the consent manager will be responsible to me, not to the company. Uh, another thing is that consent managers are required to be registered with the data protection board. So data protection board is going to be set up by uh, this uh, body uh, uh, like uh, MEIT, uh, which will be looking after the implementation of DPDPA and data protection board will be the final uh, board, which will resolve all the different conflicts if any conflict ever arise. <clears throat> Secondly, data principal may give, manage, review, or withdraw consent to the data fiduciary directly or through a consent manager. So they can request the consent manager that, hey, please delete my data and uh, please ask the companies to delete my data. And then the company has to delete it. So according to current understanding, this consent manager can work with different companies and act as a single point of contact for the data fiduciary and uh, or like possibly uh, companies can also appoint the consent managers uh, which will be reporting to the data fiduciary and be registered with the data protection board but then still working with the companies directly uh, one of the key things is that users would not want to pay for a consent manage uh, management uh, right or consent management fees uh, for example so Currently, according to our understanding that we have got uh, by talking to different experts, uh, more than likely what is going to happen is that companies will appoint a consent manager, which will be registered with the data protection board and be responsible for the management of data or consent management to the data fiduciary. So there might be few uh, of such consent managers that might act as an intermediary and report to the user, but being paid by the company. Because again, like uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's very hard for end users to man maintain, understand the details of the act and pay for the consent manager. So yeah, uh, I mean, uh, that's the key thing about consent management uh, that we wanted to cover today. Uh, happy to, I, I think I would want to open the forum and make it more of a discussion session uh, going forward uh, for the next uh, five to 10 minutes and then take it from there. Yeah, I have one question. Uh, if, uh, okay, can I ask now? Sure. Hey, where you're drawing a distinction between stopping to process and deletion, Mm -hmm. Right. Supposing a data subject sends in a request to stop processing his data, right? They seem to be this little confusion, or I don't know, uh, please clarify here. Now, the definition of processing that is included in Digital Personal Data Protection Act also includes storage. Right. Okay. So, in fact, I was opening the act and looking at the definition of processing, it includes storage also, right? Now, right. supposing you are, you are processing my data and I as a data principal send you a request to stop processing my data, mm -hmm. technically, if you continue to store, you're still processing my data, right? Uh, so not really. So how can, so how can it be mm -hmm. that you have not deleted my data mm -hmm. but still complied with my request to stop processing my data when the definitive processing includes storage? Correct. So uh, to answer that, uh, Data processing doesn't mean storage directly. Uh, what data processing, uh, stopping processing the data means that they should not be using that uh, user's data for any of the activities uh, within the company. So for example, uh, let's say you are a payment provider. You, by me um, making sure that you stop processing my data is that you stop sharing my data with any of the third parties like banks or anything. Uh, you must not provide my data to anyone. You must not, you can uh, stop providing the services to me. Uh, for example, let's say if I uh, ask Flipkart, Flipkart can say you can, cannot order anything because I have asked you to stop my uh, processing my data. So they can say no to any service as well, uh, but they can still maintain that data. And one of the reasons is that the law specifically says that even if I withdraw the consent, if I have ordered for a service, so for example, from an e-com website, I might have uh, ordered for uh, 
some goods or from a bank, I might have ordered that, hey, like uh, transfer the money for tomorrow. That should still happen. And that's why uh, that data storage becomes really important. Uh, can this be a legal uh, challenge uh, going forward? Maybe the lawyers are, uh, uh, see, because I, I'm looking at purely from a legal perspective. I mean, what you're saying is from an operational perspective, while all of us agree, mm -hmm. but uh, the way the framers of the law have defined processing, uh, what would practically on the ground be constitute any difference between a request to stop processing data and a request to delete data, uh, what really would the difference be something that, uh, uh, and I'm talking with reference to either if somebody changes the definition of processing within the act and goes about, looks like uh, this is more of an operational decision, operational interpretation, but a legal interpretation could uh, uh, come to the conclusion that until and unless you delete the data, you're not uh, stopped processing. Okay. Uh, maybe some of the lawyers uh, may have a view uh, on that. Uh, so I think it is very clear in the act uh, that uh, what data processing means, or uh, data processing clearly means how the user data or like where the user data is being used within the companies. I'll read uh, the definition. I'll read the definition of processing, okay? Mm -hmm. In fact, in, I had, before I got it out, so I even asked that, uh, so what it says is, uh, uh, this is uh, into the definitions, the, which is under uh, section two of the definitions are there. Uh, there is a uh, definition under uh, VWX. Processing in addition to personal data means a wholly or partly automated operation or set of operations performed on digital personal data and includes operations such as collection, recording, organization, structuring, storage, adaptation, retrieval, use, alignment or combination, indexing, sharing, disclosure by transmission, dissemination, or otherwise making available restriction, erasure, or destruction. So within this definition of processing, clearly storage is included in that definition. And thereby arising, uh, leading to this doubt that, uh, you know, uh, uh, what really is the distinction between a request to stop processing data and a request to delete data? Uh, right. Uh, yeah, I, I think like uh, according to like my understanding and talking to the legal teams, uh, what I understand. Yeah, correct. Like, uh, what you I, I understand is what you've given is an operational interpretation. Right. But the uh, uh, you know the legal interpretation could differ, and uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, so, Nav, uh, so can I help sir. you, sir? Some issue? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. See here, when you uh, look into the definition. Uh, there is certain legal aspects we need, we need to know. That is, in uh, relation to personal data means partly uh, automated operation or set of operations. It's yeah. only a set of operations, digital personal data, and includes. So processing is not defined. It is an inclusive definition. Correct, only correct. if it is a set of operation performed, even if you delete or whatsoever is also uh, included here. And it includes, here it can be expansive. Any similar exactly. operations, it need not be only deletion, addition. It could be any other things, even saving. Correct. Correct. Could be right. uh, yeah. a set of operations performed. To store also, you perform an operation and store. And therefore, this processing definition is all inclusive. And it doesn't say processing means. It doesn't say. It says includes. So right, there's right. an expansive meaning we can draw. That's what I sir, feel. Sir, sir while, I, while I agree that point, you know, so such interpretational dispute can arise if whatever we are doing is not included in the definition. Inclusive versus exhaustive means, okay. But here what is happening is storage is already included in the definition given in the act, right? So whether storage constitutes processing or not, about that there should be no doubt because the definition is an inclusive definition, right? For example, if storage were not to have been included in the definition, then a doubt could have arisen. But here he has explicitly included the word storage. So there's no room for doubt as far as the interpreting whether storage constitutes processing or not. The word storage is included in the definition given. So definitely storage does constitute processing. Ramesh, sir, you are saying something? So my, my interpretation, even from GDPR perspective, as well as from here. Okay. Hmm. Now, what 
processing includes collecting the data that is one activity or mm -hmm. you are manipulating the data another activity yeah. mm -hmm. storing the data another activity that right. means let's say a significant a data fiduciary mm -hmm. as an organization may involve only collecting the data for example right. that's all that's the definition of processing or a data fiduciary organization is only storing the data now right. mm -hmm. their people probably why this includes the definition includes a b c d etc is otherwise mm -hmm. a general definition of interpretation of the processing is you do something i have mm -hmm. some data i manipulate something uh, input output processing that's uh, i think right. they're trying to say now coming to your question here mm -hmm. two different activities we are talking one somebody withdrawing the consent very good he has withdrawn mm -hmm. however mm -hmm. Is that organization bound to delete the data on immediately withdraw the consent? Answer is no, because that particular data, what that organization had held or at that point of time, it might be required for different purposes, what he said, one or two, right? Banking, exa banking example or something had given. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that this would be linked to the organizational policy that the withdrawal and by when I need to. If I am completing, I don't need his data for any more for the purposes what I sought for, then probably they will delete it is what I understand. But I am looking at the definition what you read in two, one, two, three, four, in, uh, exclusively each one. Yeah. That's what my interpretation of definition of processing itself. So yeah, I think so that, that, yeah. my interpretation, Ramesh. Yes, sir. Even viewing or reading is also processing. Absolutely. Right, right. Absolutely. 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 So yes, what we are yes. trying to say is here that collecting and processing and storing. No, that, not that way I'm trying to say. Storing the data itself is a processing. Yeah. Right. You're right, Nagendra. That's what oh. I have. Yes, no. Processing should not be taken in the literal meaning. Yeah. The yeah. Find meaning we should absorb. So I just want yeah. I think Correct. I would like to add something there. Uh, so as everyone mentioned that storing or using the data in some form or even collecting the data, it's processing of the data. So once the uh, consent is withdrawn, yeah. none of this thing can happen. That doesn't yeah. mean that the stored data that already exists needs to be deleted. What it means is that it can't be moved to any other place. It can't be stored to a different data source. Uh, for example, like you can't move the data from Excel sheet to a uh, database or it can't be used for any purposes like analytics or any internal services. Uh, but as long as it is stored in the same place, it needs not to be deleted immediately. Yeah, no, no. The key word here is that adjustments are not immediate. That means exactly. for specific time period, they might need to hold the data where they need to have the justification. And hence, as I said, withdrawing the consent and deletion permanent to uh, Subrayadu's question is a very valid question. Need to be interrelated in other, you know, one or other way. And then there need to be a policy to say by when I will be deleting it, even if you are withdrawing the consent. It may not be on the same day. And even erasure is also there. The term uh, erasure yeah. is also there. Yeah, but I have, I have one more challenge here, Ramesh. Yes, sir. Example, uh, in my experience, let's say healthcare, uh, right. uh, let's say hospital. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one more uh, outsourced company responsible only for backing up of the data. Correct. They don't even process it. They don't even look Correct. at it. Nothing they do. They do Iron mountain. Backup. backup of of the patient information. Even there also, it is a sort of processing. Iron mountain, right? Backup. Yeah, correct. Iron mountain. Yes. C correct. It's a backup they, organization. They have just access to it, but they cannot open it. They cannot read it. They cannot process. It. Nothing they do, but. Just they have access to the in, data. In my, in my opinion, they come under the DPDP or GDPR because the definition of processing includes storage, let us say. Yeah. So I'm just only an organization storing subrides or data. That's all. Yeah. I'm not yeah. doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. in that yeah. case, all the... Yes, sir. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Ramesh. Yes, sir. Yeah, Ramesh. Sir, they are only Godown providers. Correct. 
you simply go down in that's all correct correct i sir we we have seen even in isms perspective right uh, the physical records there are some like a bank right data bank or whatever records maintained by them right a fire proof uh, waterproof cabinet and etc where that organization did not have the capacity to hold that so they give it to them they also coming under a processor organization or they no. come under a kind of yeah i mean they don't process anything no, holding that's what holding. i'm telling sir processing should not be taken in the literal meaning Correct. Should, it is defined word and we should adopt that legal aspect yes, even yes. storing by one or more even storing could be different people different aspects may be stored even then it's a processing in the real literal value we say no it is not a processing but that is not the meaning the law is want to give law wants even statical aspects also to be called as processing in this okay. way. Okay. like so lawyer, 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 your, yeah. things are all otherwise Lawyers are going to have very busy time going forward. Thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Ramesh sir, Ramesh sir, you are. Yeah, forward. Ramesh. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Thank I, I, Thank I, I, I know uh, Apurva has not touched it, but, but one uh, I know Apurva's product, so I just kind of briefing it. Maybe Apurva, you want to talk about your yes. uh, other product ability to track the data in various locations. Maybe that might give a little more clarity in terms of where you are coming from. Yeah. So I think before even that, uh, like immediate uh so again like currently the law doesn't state this but uh there is this thing called e-privacy directive that eu uh passed a couple of years back and which i was responsible to implement at meta and uh it is clearly stated that the companies can store the data specifically for 10 days and post that they have to just store it in an aggregated form so i am pretty sure that uh when the actual law is drafted uh, or like released they might say like the timeline that when the data should be deleted uh, from the point of consent withdrawal to the data deletion. So that might happen or there might be ambiguity then it's for lawyers probably to come up with an answer. Uh, so yeah, we can only probably just see what the government comes up with. On yeah, that, but, but, yeah. Can, you, can you briefly talk about your capability in the tool side of it? Sure. So what we do is like we help companies understand what user data they have, where they have stored that data within their environment. And then secondly, we help them understand uh, how it is being processed or how it is being used for what services they are companies using the user data. And we also help companies uh, understand that, okay, like what are the third parties that they are sharing the data with? So when a user asks that, hey, please delete the data, they actually can ask those third parties that, hey, we shared the user data with you, please delete it as well. So that's what we are doing. Uh, technically, like we are a data access governance platform uh, that uh, helps companies uh, understand uh, from like complete data flow, understanding where the user data is to understand how it is being processed. And then like if they want to delete the user data to do that. And we are supported by DSCI. Uh, first of all, um, they have been our biggest backers and have been uh, invested by Nexus Venture Partners and amazing people across the world. So yeah. Uh, and any other questions uh, or any pointers that anyone wants to discuss or anything around content manager because that's where I see most contention coming up uh, from a lot of people that hey like if the company is not uh, you know assigning a content manager then who is I mean that's one of the biggest gaps currently that a lot of people are worried about uh, uh, hi, uh, my name is Kalyan. I have a question here. Actually, what I see in that, uh, I mean, through Facebook as well as the uh, Google account, uh, last uh, six months back, I traveled almost all across South India. Uh, it was completely my traveling, where I've been and what I did there. Uh, everything was captured by the Google. Okay. Uh, without, it's captured by Google itself. Without my concerns, they shared my data to someone else. Immediately, that guy was uh, got my information, uh, how you traveled, and you have briefed me uh, the traveling, all those things. 
in this scenario, uh, where I put my concerns here, and how can I make the uh, challenges to either the uh, Facebook or the what we call Google account? Last time that Google was faced the uh, law by the U.S. government, but they are not implemented same thing in India. So I think uh, the other thing, uh, uh, being work, uh, having worked in such companies, uh, right, uh, as well, uh, like I can probably provide you with some answer to that. So first is that uh, they cannot and they do not share your data without your consent. Like you might have given the consent at some place or the other, uh, your actual location data. So they generally use that location data to provide you with ads, but that's that data doesn't go out of their parameter. So like Facebook or Google doesn't share that sensitive data with anyone uh, unless you have explicitly given consent uh, through that other app, which a lot of times we do, uh, but a lot of times it doesn't happen. So for example, there was a payment app that I downloaded and they were asking to track all of my location. And I was like, okay, I'm, I don't know why do you want my location? Uh, or like, why do you, and they wanted to track all my activity across all the web. And I was not very sure why a payment app would need it. Uh, but like a lot of users, they end up giving such consents without even knowing that. Uh, so for example, I think like currently in uh, iOS, they explicitly ask the apps to ask for such consents. In Android, it doesn't. So. I, I think like it's more like we end up giving the consents that we don't even want. There are a lot of apps that collect all your messages without you not even knowing it. So yeah, those things happen. And one of the companies was, I think, sued for it as well. Yeah. Uh, how can we I take into say, form? I would say this is something like blanket consent, you know, yeah. use my data wherever you want. <laughs> Yeah, they are using the same way itself. They are doing some analytics based on that. Uh, uh, they are giving the shared sharing. That's why because uh, I am what I'm giving the example uh, in the May month, I traveled across the South India. Based on my traveling itself, they made some analytics on that. Okay, based on that, uh, okay, you've been to uh, some temple. Okay, this is the crowd when you are there in the time. Okay, uh, after that, you've been to some other uh, somewhere. And again, they did they did some analytics on that and shared the traveling in between these two locations. Okay, this guy was uh, traveled in between these two locations. This is the time was uh, consumed in these two locations. If you want, you can reach him uh, like that. They told uh, the guy called me uh, amazing because he called me through my Facebook uh, messenger messenger chat is there now in Facebook. They called me with the phone itself. I was wondered how you can get all the information. Boss, what you are, where you are traveling, everything is captured by the Facebook itself, they are saying. Yeah. So I think to answer that, probably there are certain features, like uh, I, I think there's Facebook neighbor feature or something, or like some of these features where you can track where your friends are, or share the location with your friends and stuff. And it is quite possible that through some way or the other, you might have ended by even mistakenly sharing that uh, permissions with them and they might have got that. Because like what happens currently is that we end up doing that, uh, like sharing these things without even knowing or noticing a lot of time. Uh, and that's why it's important even for the data fiduciaries, uh, sorry, even for the data principles to go and visit the permissions that they have given every once in a while. Uh, so uh, like current DPDPA, there should be a data auditor that like audits what data the company is collecting and everything, but then that is more data fiduciary's responsibility. But as users, our responsibility is to make sure that we still go and check what permissions that we have given. Uh, like for example, a lot of apps collect your photos, a lot of apps collect your messages data, lot of apps collect your location data. So those things do happen. And yeah, I, I guess like that, that's the only way that be aware uh, and make sure that we constantly audit what data we are giving rather than just like, I mean, government can enforce these things on the data fiduciary, of course, that what data they are collecting, but then it's also our responsibilities to make sure that we audit what data we are giving to the data fiduciaries. Yes. 
one step forward i think last month i did receive route map also including in the you know in my email where and all did i travel in the month what point what hotel how long was there on the road what kilometer did i drive enter thing was there in my you know, inbox yes everything <laughs> was there in that feature in google maps it yes. takes care yeah. of everything you will find it right from the moment you must have so installed you can disable google that feature from google maps actually if you want yeah. okay apurva one quick question in your tool do you cover data discovery of structured and unstructured data both yes we cover uh, data discovery of structured and unstructured data and our implementation is like literally 15 minutes implementation uh, where we give you a script you run that into your environment we help you understand where your sensitive data is across uh, structured and uh, unstructured data uh, uh, like it doesn't matter like uh, what kind of data it is it can be log data or a pdf or a image or it can be a proper structured data and then we have a ebpf based technology so it's a kernel level collector totally non intrusive minimal computational cost so it's a state of the art uh, technology uh, being used by all the latest uh, companies uh, out there uh, so our based on that and that's why we have like 15 minutes implementation where we help you understand all uh, the places where the data is being processed within 15 minutes meaning will there be any client that will be installed on each of the endpoints or is there some central uh, you know sentry kind of a thing which sniffs yeah. the network yeah so it's it's a central uh, kind of a thing where we it is deployed with every node uh, so it's uh, like at a, a agent. firewall what at a firewall level just so to identify not at a firewall level uh, it's it's at a node level so it uh, is deployed along with your applications uh, uh, basically where the application is processed so it is deployed at a uh, operating system level uh, as such and uh, from there we monitor what are the different calls that are being made what are the different uh, services that are using the data what are the different applications that are you uh, are using the data so like completely helping you understand how the data is used would you be having any some uh, additional slides would that would help us understand how the architecture is and how you know what is required to make this possible sure sure uh, just give me one sec uh, i share that with you uh, and will this also help us to implement certain controls like for example uh, suppose if i am an account manager and i am catering to say three companies who are my clients likewise i have maybe another you know colleague who might be catering to another three four clients based on what i am uh, processing for these clients i am able to restrict that information going only to them and not to any others right so that is something that we do uh, already uh, so uh, uh, like uh, as i was mentioning that we have collectors uh, to monitor and understand how uh, like the data is being processed so these collectors uh, sit at the pod uh, with, along with the application at a kernel level so it's uh, basically it sits along with the operating system and then monitors all the calls that are happening so everything happens in the same way except that is being monitored or nothing else okay so this is in case of an application that is as i can see that application all communicate or any an api so basically any automated way of accessing the data right right likewise uh, what about the unstructured data meaning information that comes to employees via emails or maybe somebody is sharing it through an sftp mm -hmm. or there is a workflow that is triggered by something so right they might, how do we go about doing an inventorization of that and yeah. What so, will we get to see? So I think a couple of things. Uh, currently, we are not doing uh, like emails uh, uh, as such uh, because uh, that's not where the data is generally processed or, or shared or stored uh, for the end user. Like of course, like there are times that it is downloaded and uh, shared through emails, but that is something that we are not focusing on uh, uh, as such. and secondly as you mentioned that the data can be in unstructured format uh, and the end user might be using it to some of the other way 
So we have uh, this uh, proxy based architecture uh, to control uh, basically uh, to allow for control that we can access what and also to monitor for like what data is being used by the end user of the data, like which can be an employee accessing the data through uh, a file storage system or through S3 bucket or any such things. No, meaning can we can we outline what an individual holds just by scanning through his system endpoint? So currently uh, we are not doing the endpoint uh, like scanning uh, as such because for endpoint scanning, we will have to install the agents on every endpoint. And I, I think there are already solutions out there that install the agent or like that most companies use to do endpoint monitoring. So we didn't want it to kind of redo that same work again because uh, installing an agent somewhere is a challenge in itself. Uh, and that's why we are building completely agentless tech. Uh, one of the challenges that we have seen uh, that companies face with agents uh, is that it's almost 40% of their computational space is taken by those agents rather than the actual usage that could have been there. I'll tell you where the challenge is. Mm -hmm. You know, suppose if a client says that, you know, uh, that the retention requirements, whatever that may be, you know, on right. either side is over. Let's say that the max period is say 10 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, post 10 years, now your requirements are met. And now, as contractually, you need to share a data destruction certificate with them. Right. Right. So, structured data, there is no problem because there is clear visibility in terms of what is being stored, where is it, and all of that. Mm -hmm. And you would, most mature organizations would also have a client specific, you know, database which would be in an encrypted format. So which you can say, I've deleted, I've reset the encryption keys and whatever. That gives you a confidence to say that. Mm -hmm. But a whole lot of data is there in the unstructured right. uh, uh, aspect, you know? Right. And when we sign off and give that, you know, now I don't hold any of your data. Right. That has to be backed by some action, right? So, so typically I can tell you how we are doing that. Uh, that's one. And secondly, like what you said is true for a B2B company or company that is serving to other companies. But what if it's a company like Flipkart, they have millions of users and they can't have a different DB for different users. Right. So, uh, like that's one difference. And secondly, for unstructured data, right. What we are doing is we are using machine learning and uh, image processing techniques, uh, uh, basically uh, image processing and NLP techniques to help you understand where the sensitive data is or like where the data is for that particular user in an unstructured format. So for example, let's say if you store uh, data in any file storage uh, data source, like it can be S3, it can be Dropbox or anything, right? Or a Google Drive, for example, right? So we scan that for you. We help you understand, okay, like this is the user data in this particular thing like which user data is where, like uh, in that particular file. And we, like you can simply redact it as well, like just uh, put a black sign over like whatever the sensitive data is, or you can delete uh, the file as well. So we help you do that. Okay, understood. So how different is this from a classification tool? So sir, uh, classification tool uh, definitely helps you understand uh, what sensitive data you have or like what data you have and where in your systems, but it doesn't help you understand how that data is being processed in real time or like what are the different use cases of that data. So for example, a particular data within a fintech company can be used for payments, for uh, salary, for uh, like communications, right? So those things, a classification tool doesn't help you understand and that's where we come in. So classification is just the first part. Uh, and like, even in the law, like it says that, okay, you should know where the data is being stored, but then there are so many other things. And uh, like after classification, there are certain steps that the company should be able to take. So the classification tools don't do that. Okay. Okay. I wanted as a layman on the information, what right. is this end point vulnerability you spoke? I did not understand. Because this word was used in one of the meetings also in the UIDAI meetings. They said mm -hmm. endpoint vulnerability, whether you have checked like that, they were telling. So I yeah. just want you to elaborate 
the technical so, aspect about that sure sir so i think the end point vulnerability in most senses means that okay like vulnerability through your systems the like let's say we have 10 employees they have 10 uh, mobile phones their laptops so the data can be breached through their laptops right like i can install a malware into your laptop and then uh, since you might have access to some data within the company then i can access all that through your laptop so that's basically an endpoint vulnerability where like i can access the endpoint endpoint is the final point basically which might be a laptop a phone or like any such things uh as such or it can be simply an email as well so those things are called endpoint and that's what an endpoint vulnerability is that okay like uh someone can remotely access my laptop or someone installed a bug into my phone and now can hear all the calls that i am doing or can control my phone konandram sir sup suppose it sir a usb drive is enabled it's not disabled for example right on your laptop is an endpoint vulnerability yeah. so so if we look at data leakage as a point and what are the different ways that it can happen from that laptop would Correct. consider or construe to be as endpoint vulnerability but I was, in one of those uh, vulnerability aspects they were discussing there they were using maximum thing or this uh, endpoint vulnerability i did not know i just kept quiet i did not want to become a fool no i have a poor guard who can clarify me so i am very happy i learned something thank you sir uh apurva would you also have any dashboards or any outcome of this a uh, tool which we can see we can understand as to what can be the yeah sure, sure. Uh, end result of it sure let me show you right now uh, is data discovery part of the tool capability this reena yes data discovery data discovery is a part uh, of like what we are uh, do with the first part so let me share my screen uh, uh -huh. so i hope you can see my screen uh, so here we do data discovery so we to show you all the different data sources that we you have within your environment it can be a structured data it can be unstructured data it can be anything basically then we help you understand what sensitive data that you have within your environment it can be driving license passport anything basically like we show you the overview so for current uh, example currently like we have a lot of location data and uh, person data uh, as such and these are all our databases as such so uh, nothing will it, will you tell us file names and path as well yes we do uh, i will show you right here uh, uh, we show the file names and path as well uh okay i think on this data I, I let me show you a different database uh as such it integrates with email so we can directly analyze and send the email to the user uh, yes basically uh it we have a certain integrations with email slack everything so for mm -hmm. example here we show the complete path uh so yeah this name data uh is like in this particular data base data table uh, so we show you the complete path of where that sensitive data exists uh, as well and then and what the through data? the through yes, the sir. workflow can we communicate through email to the user and take confirmation for deletion and then execute a command to delete yes uh, you can do that so uh, currently we haven't built the consent management flow yet but the data deletion flow is already there uh, so we show you uh, where the data is uh, like what particular user data is there as well and then you can delete it as long as you give us the user id that needs to be deleted uh, we also show you who are the different data accessors uh, it can be any service like for example a query processor is using it it can be any third party as well that you are sharing the data with or mm. it can be any internal user as well uh, that is using the data uh, as such and uh, it can be like basically so th these are the different ways that my data is being used uh, for database for building agents uh, or by these different employees of the companies uh, as such currently employees don't use any data uh can we tag uh, the record saying these are um, high priority ones which we need to make decision quickly versus 
some low priority ones so currently we don't support that but uh, i mean that is a very easy add for us like we, we can add that uh, thing like if it is a requirement okay okay and uh, this uh, uh, who's your competition uh, have you looked at security ai as a yeah i was going to say yeah. how so security ai is a dspm tool uh, as such uh, right and it's a us based company uh, i am guessing uh, so it's a, it's a dspm tool so most of the current companies are a dspm tool so it's a data security portion management so what they help you do is they help you understand what data you have and the data classification and where you have that data uh, but they don't help you understand how that data is being used uh, like as i currently showed or they don't help you understand uh, any real time processing of the data or with the data deletion part so they would help you understand with the data classification your data posture and everything but not beyond that and i think like that's where the majority of the things comes in where like you need to uh, tell the users how their data is being processed how uh, uh, basically like delete their data what third parties are using that data and stuff but third party unless you integrate uh, uh, how do you know to which third party the user has sent the data because currently if you assume that the data is being shared via uh, sftp protocol or right. an email attachment right so uh, i can yeah. tell you here uh, right so if uh, you are sharing the data uh, through anything like uh, uh, automatically uh, like that is not email basi uh, basically so uh, directly through your data sources uh, we tell you about, uh, so we, again like it's an ebpf uh, based solution we monitor all the network calls uh, happening so for example we are sharing data with github facebook uh, amazon aws and some other things uh, as such uh here uh in in our system so we just install that ebpf agent at a network level and monitor that and you can oh. control uh it uh, by putting a http proxy that we provide so, so the destination uh, address can be whitelisted and you can track that traffic right. I, i mean without even whitelisting you can track all the traffic and you can uh. whitelist something to make sure that we give you security incidents on top of that as well so this is a solution that is actually currently being used by a lot of big companies in india that we provide yeah. so razer pay jupiter everyone is using our solution for that oh this is a very nice thing to yeah yeah no no so, good so thing this is for a file or this is at an aggregate level so this is at uh, uh, like uh, basically a data level so it can be row column uh, as such or it can be any file or it can be anything basically so we can actually pinpoint from a particular file saying that this has gone to these these domains yes. or these are the recipients of it yes externally yes okay please please do share your number because would love to connect with you sure sure this is good i i mean uh, i if you are connected with manju probably she can connect us uh, yes yeah mapur i can connect to deepak no issues sure uh, i think then that's it probably uh, was lovely uh, uh talking to everyone uh, thanks ramesh sir thanks um, uh, manju for providing a great platform uh, to discuss the dpdps for excited about uh, government making moves into this uh, i think everyone like i have talked to is uh, has been super worried uh, post the 80 million aadhar card data breach and i think this topic has come up again and again in fact uh, i was talking to uh, vinayak sir and atul from dsci yesterday in a panel and uh, this topic came up yesterday as well so yeah super excited about this space uh, right now and uh, the progress that we are making as a country thank you thank you uh, apur for uh, such a wonderful discussion uh it was not just a uh, you know presentation or talk it was a wonderful discussion informative discussion with a lot of insights uh, uh navi sir would you like to uh, say something before i invite uh, mr ramesh okay navi sir no nothing specific uh, you please go ahead yeah okay i uh, uh, invite uh, mr ramesh kota for the closing remarks 
Thank you for introducing uh, Apoor to FDBP, <laughs> Ramesh. Yeah, Apoor, uh, I, I think uh, you started with the kind of a, uh, I would say the, the T20 cricket started slowly, but eventually I think went all the way to the technology and then covered everything. You made the discussion very exciting and the evening was also very useful in terms of the sharing of information and what you can do and what you've been doing it. Great to know that. Uh, I know uh, you generated interest from uh, Deepak Varde and Darina. That itself shows that your product and potential. Uh, keep up doing the great work. And I think we are all excited to know how you track the data, data privacy, uh, how the technology is evolving to meet the DPDPA challenges as well. So thank you for uh, sharing the session and, and walking us through freely. Uh, looks like we might need another session from you, both from a tool and technology perspective. So based on the interest of the users, we might request one to reach out to you once again. Thank you for your time and uh, sharing your thoughts. Thank you all for uh, joining the discussion with Deepak uh, Purva and making it very more useful uh, day for today. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Much. Everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you all. <laughs>